So this is something I've worked on for a long time now. Um, simulation of strain epitaxial growth in three dimensions using kinetic Monte Carlo. So I probably don't need to tell this audience. I usually give this talk to all math people who never know, didn't, don't know what epitaxial growth is. But anyway, this is epitaxial growth. And I guess I don't need to tell you guys this. Um, so the picture that you might not have seen in, is this one. I showed this yesterday. It's a great picture. This is um, an example of heteroepitaxial growth. Um, this is an actual picture of uh, germanium uh, being deposited on silicon. And uh, um, what's happening is that the, the germanium, chemically, you know, germanium and, and silicon are quite similar. And one of the, they have two slight differences. One is that the surface energy of germanium is, is slightly less than the surface energy of silicon. And germanium atoms are, are slightly, have a slightly larger lattice spacing than silicon atoms. So what that means is that if I put a layer of, uh, try to put a layer of germanium on silicon, um, it will strain the surface, okay? The, the, the germanium is trying to spread out and uh, it's sitting on top of a, a, a wafer of silicon and so it can't spread out, so it's just, it gets strained. Now, the, the, the surface energy is, is enough to keep that, that layer flat, that's, and that's called a wetting layer. If you keep depositing more material down, eventually the system will say, we, there's, a, there's too much strain energy, maybe I can do something better to keep my energy down. And so what it does is it forms, it relaxes and forms these quantum dots. Um, now, so these things uh, are, it's quite interesting, uh, uh, is that these appear rather, at a, a, rather suddenly at, a, at a, actually a fairly critical thickness of the film. So you're depositing material, and then at a, a critical amount of material deposited, these things appear rather rapidly in the, um, uh, a, a, in, the, in the process of the film evolving. And when they ultimately form, they form in as, a, as faceted objects. And uh, that's not too surprising that they're faceted. After all, uh, um, the surface energy of, of, these, of, of these semiconductor materials is, is very uh, anisotropic. They, they're naturally um, faceted materials. And so what I, what I want to do is tell you about how that we've been doing work on trying to simulate this. And what I'm going to just do is show you the result of one of our simulations. Um, so it's not exactly the same thing, but it's pretty close. Um, so again, this was done uh, with Kinetic Monte Carlo. It's on a simple cubic lattice. And the, the, the parameters, I'll tell you more about this later, but the parameters of this, uh, uh, of this Kinetic Monte Carlo simulation were chosen not to model a, a specific uh, material system, but to be sort of qualitatively in the ballpark of typical semiconductor materials, okay? Um, and so what happens is, again, you deposit, so again, there's a, what we're doing is we're depositing uh, yellow atoms, which you can think of as germanium, on a blue substrate, which you can think of as silicon. And you, when you deposit it, you get a wetting layer, and then on top of this wetting layer, you get these, these islands forming. Um, this length scale here is about, uh, about 70 nanometers. So it's not a particularly big system, but it's not small either. Um, the time scale that happened was about, this took over, this was at over three seconds in physical time. Um, so there's, the, there's the, uh, some of the statistics. Um, so, as I already said that, the, it took for about 40 billion kinetic Monte Carlo steps to, 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 that occurred during that process. Um, and at the end of this calculation, there are 200,000 atoms moving around. Now, to put that in perspective, um, there's no way that you could do anything like that with um, molecular dynamics. It's just not possible. So, so the sort of at this point in, 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 in science, these are our, from a modeling point of view, these are our choices, okay? You, you can resort to molecular dynamics, which is uh, very difficult. Um, then you can do, uh, go all the way to, to full continuum models. And of course, there's lots of problems with this. Lots of physics is hard to incorporate and and many times it just gets the wrong physics. 
There are other methods that sort of are continuum-like, which have some advantages. But I, I think kinetic Monte Carlo is sort of ideally suited uh, because it's exactly between these, and it actually has enough physics that we can say things that I think we can get a good idea what's happening with the system, but it's still tractable enough to actually do uh, simulations on length scales and time scales that are of actual uh, of ex that are relevant for experiments. Um, so the basic idea behind kinetic Monte Carlo is that you you basically model it as a, a, a series of, of like a big Markov chain is that is you say you have certain events and you assign a rate to them and the basic idea is you have a, an energy of your system okay your system has an energy you, however we want to define it that's part of the model and then if you want to uh, move an atom you have to uh, compute its energy in the, the state that you're in you have to define a transition state and then this, the change in energy tells you uh, that's, that's sort of a, called an energy barrier, and the rate is proportional to minus this energy barrier divided by um, kT. So the idea is then is that as the temperature goes up, the effect of the barrier goes down, and it, it, events become easier and easier to happen. Of course, you have to know or know, assume what the important rates are. Now, there's an even simpler version of this, which is, um, oh, okay, so then... Before I do that, let me just tell you. So, so once you have all these rates, you've collected all these rates, then what do you do? You make a list of all the events or atoms, and then you uh, compute the total rate, and then you uh, have a hopping probability. So this is the probability that an atom will move or an event will occur. Then you use um, this as a probability distribution, and you basically pick an atom or an event from this list, and um, once you pick it, you just allow that event or atom to move. You update the list and repeat. So that's the basic idea. Um, and what we're going to be doing is looking at what is a, a highly simplified version of, 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 of a Monte Carlo model, which is based on what is called bond counting. So the basic idea is that the atoms that have the most bonds move the slowest, and atoms that are, are weakly bonded move quicker. So this atom here has one bond, so it hops easy, um, whereas this atom here has uh, very few bonds, or has more bonds, so it hops a little bit slower. And, um, and then basically, they just when the atom is picked, it just hops to a, near, a nearby site. But it always, the only atoms on the surface move. And the nice thing about, even though this model is very simple, just this model alone can capture many, many basic features of, a, of, 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 of surface diffusion. So for example, uh, you, can under, you can understand surface diffusion. If you add deposition to this, you can include uh, things like nucleation. You can include stochastic effects. Um, you can understand uh, most crystal facets are, are uh, most surfaces are highly anisotropic. So the surface energy is highly anisotropic, and that's not an easy thing to model. Whereas these kind of models sort of naturally encode that sort of behavior. Okay, so this is basically what I'm saying, that, that these kinetic Monte Carlo models actually can capture uh, almost all the physics of a continuum model, but they go much farther. They can include all sorts of, 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 of effects that would be virtually impossible to include uh, in, um, in, in continuum models. And people haven't used them in part because they can be computationally slow. But, you know, c computers are changing. And, and, you know, that might have been true t 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But now, you know, we're, we're at the point where this is actually, this, this is not the big drawback it used to be. Okay, so the model that uh, I want to talk about now is uh, how do you include elasticity into a simple bond counting model like this. And this goes back to uh, a paper by these gentlemen here, uh, Orr, Kessler, Snyder, and Sander. Len Sander is the a professor at, these are both professors at uh, Michigan. This professor here was, Len Sander was the guy that kind of introduced me to this subject. Um, anyway, the, the basic idea is you have, a, you have the same kind of bond counting model that you had before. Uh, you put the atoms on a, on a cubic lattice, 
or a square lattice in 2D. You count nearest and next nearest neighbor bonds. And then you, have a, uh, you modify the hopping rate in the following way. So this was the original hopping rate. You're just counting the bonds. But now we have this extra term here, which is called delta W. And this, this delta W is the contribution to the, the hopping rate due to the elastic interactions. And I'll, I'll just tell you what it is right now. It turns out to be that delta W is, is calculated as follows. What you do is you model the whole, the, the, the whole system as a ball and spring model. And you assume that, that, that they're always in mechanical equilibrium. And then you can define the total elastic energy as the energy in all those springs. Then delta W is the change in energy of, suppose I want to know the, the hopping rate of an atom, atom P. Then delta W is the change in energy. Uh, you take the uh, W with the energy with the atom, and then you remove the atom, and you calculate the change in energy. And in general, this number will be positive, uh, which means that in general, uh, uh, strain tends to lower the, uh, um, the uh, increases the hopping rate. It makes it easier for atoms to hop. So what's the energy? So, so the energy, the energetic picture you should have in mind is as follows. Um, if 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 you had a, a if you had, if, if you deposited pure um, germanium on silicon and you had a flat layer, then that layer would get compressed, be compressed in this direction and stretched in that direction, and there would be a, there would be a considerable amount of, of strain energy. And so what happens then is that uh, eventually, um, now this could be, notice this can get, you could imagine that the wafer is very big, okay? So as the bigger the wafer is, there there's, keeps to be more, there's more and more elastic energy. And at some point, if you just change the configuration a bit, you can actually let the system can relax. And this configuration here can actually have less energy because it can relax. Even though the surface energy has been increased, you, you can have an energetic gain by the formation of these islands. So that's what's happening in these, these, these systems. Uh, that's why they form these, these island structures. So in a little bit more detail, the, the model looks something like this. We have, uh, the atoms are on a square lattice. It's, so it's semi-infinite in this direction, okay? Because we, the, again, the, Elastic interactions tend to be long range, and so we didn't want to have to worry about how deep the substrate would have to be, so we just made it semi-infinite. Um, then it's periodic in this direction. Uh, we have next nearest and next nearest neighbors. Uh, so we have chemical bonds, and there's three kinds of chemical bonds. There are the silicon-silicon bonds, silicon-germanium bonds, and germanium-germanium bonds. Okay, and so um, and there are so that there's the, so there's these chemical bonds. So this would be a, a silicon-silicon bond, or that would be germanium-germanium bond. This would be silicon-silicon. And so that's just like the bond counting model that we talked about before. Now the other thing that we have is that the, that the these atoms have our um, so the, the the this is a silicon atom. It likes to be on a lattice, say, of lattice size one. The germanium would like to be on a lattice of about that's about four percent bigger. So what that means is that there's, a f that, that there's springs here, but these springs here, there's a force on these. It's trying to pull this apart. Down here, these ones are actually um, fairly happy. The only reason they wouldn't be exactly happy is because they've been pulled apart by these ones, because there's a big limit. These are all coupled together by springs. So you have these nearest and next nearest neighbor spring constants, KL and KD. So these two ingredients here, Give you allow you to calculate the total energy of the system, and then um, then you just basically use those to calculate the rate, and then the system evolves by letting the surface atoms hop. So you basically calculate the total energy of the system. That allows you to calculate the hopping uh, rates of these atoms, and when, if you pick an atom to hop, it just hops to the left or to the right. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so what are, the, what are the issues here? Well, the big computational bottleneck, of course, is the calculating the rates. So we need to know the rates for all the atoms. So what this means is that I would have to uh, remove each and every atom 
uh, compute the resulting elastic field, the resulting change in energy, and then use that to calculate the rates. Okay, so I'd have to go, th so for every one of these surface atoms, I need to know its rate. So I have to, I have the energy of the system here, I take the atom off, let the system relax, calculate the energy, and that is the delta W that I need to calculate, use for the hopping rate, okay? So I have to do that for every single atom, okay? Then uh, I can, so it's just, just to move one atom. So if I want to move one atom, I have to know the rates for all of them, okay? So every time I, so, so I move this atom, so I go to every single one and I remove it and calculate the change in energy. Then I can calculate, then, I, then, I, then I'll remove an atom and hop it, and then I repeat this procedure. So it's very time consuming because you have to keep doing all these global updates of the elastic field. So how do you get around this? So there's lots of ways to get around this. Um, so there, for our work, there were three basic ingredients. The first ingredient was to solve the elastic field really fast. Okay, so I'm not gonna have time to talk about that, but basically we need to update this, solve, the, solve this elastic problem. It's a big linear system and we have to solve it fast. This is a problem that mathematicians have thought about uh, a lot and they have a lot of useful things to say about it. And one of the most amazing things they have to say about it is this, is what's called multigrid. You basically solve the problem on multiple scales simultaneously in, in essence. And um, so it's a beautiful idea. The devils are in the, the devil's in the details. So every problem has some special detail. Uh, in our case, the, the, the details are um, that w that we had to have a, because we have a semi-infinite substrate and we don't want to solve for it, we had to put in an artificial boundary condition. So coupling that artificial boundary condition to the multigrid was a little tricky. And the other thing that's a little tricky is that we have uh, the domain is not, normally multigrid methods are, are e most easily handled on a, uh, if you're on a Cartesian grid. We don't have, our, our, our unknowns are not on a Cartesian grid, there, there's a free boundary here. So that was another issue. So um, anyway, so that was, uh, that was one of the things we did. The other thing that we did was uh, we realized that in fact, some of the time you can actually up, you do not need to update the elastic field globally. You can do a local update. And actually we worked, this isn't just a, like a, a fudge, actually we worked quite hard to theoretically justify the, the, that this is an accurate, um, robust procedure that, that, that one can rely on. And, and actually it, gain, it, it buys you a lot in terms of um, computational speed. And, and then the, the, the other thing that's nice about it is that, that you can check after you've done it. So there's an a, a posteriori check of the error to make sure that your local update was actually indeed valid. And if it wasn't valid, then you're forced to to do a global solve and you, res you, you fall back on this method. And then the last uh, uh, ingredient was the fact is that we found an, a, a rather simple way of getting an estimate, an, an upper bound on the rates. So we can, I, I told you it's expensive to compute the rates, but it turns out it's fairly cheap to, to get an upper bound on the rates. And so once you have an upper bound on the rate, then you can use that as, a, uh, as an estimate, and what you do basically is you fill your rate tables with upper bounds on the rates rather than the rates themselves. Since they're upper bounds on the rates, you don't have to worry about uh, not picking the right thing. What you have to worry about is picking, the, picking it uh, um, and having to reject it. So the way it works is you, you pick it with, this upper, with an upper bound, then once you've picked it, then you check to see if you actually calculated the rate correctly. And if you have a very good estimate of the rate, then odds are you should have calculated the rate, but you don't end up having to calculate rates that you don't need to. Okay, so these are the references. So this is the um, multigrid. This is how the expanding box method worked. So basically you just, you, you start at some spot here and you just, you, um, so, this is, so you, you check, you try to relax the atoms locally, and then you check to see what kind of error you make, and you just keep expanding outwards until you get to a point where the solution um, is less than a prescribed error. And if you ever, don't ever get to that situation, then you just do a global solve. Um, 
Now, the, the, uh, the, 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 the way the, um, the cheap upper bounds work is as follows. It turns out that the, the, the total elastic energy uh, of the atom, so Wij is the energy of the atom on the surface. Okay, so in other words, if I go back to, well, that picture will work. I look at this atom here. Suppose I want to try estimate what the change in elastic energy is if I was to remove that atom. Well, the first thing you, can, you would imagine is that if I looked at this atom, I'm going to remove this atom. What, what is the, the basic thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break all the springs that are connected to that atom. Okay, so there's a spring here, 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 here. So at, there's a very crude approximation. You could set, assume that the change in elastic energy will just be that the, all the energy in the springs directly connected to that atom. Okay? So that's a crude approximation. But what happens in reality, of course, is that when you take that atom, the system relaxes. But it turns out that, that the amount the whole system relaxes to, is to a very good approximation proportional to the amount of energy that was contained in the springs connected to that. So in other words, the Change, the, the, the change in elastic energy is, tends to be uh, between two values. There's an upper bound and a lower bound, and these upper and lower bounds are controlled by the energy uh, in the springs directly connected to that surface atom. So let me just show you a picture of that. So here's a, uh, an example. So here's a sort of an artificial test case that we made. Uh, there's just a, basically a bunch of structures there. We threw down a bunch of random atoms, and there's uh, so it's just some arbitrary thing that was designed to be maximally complicated. And there, are, for every single atom on this surface, we computed that we remove the atom uh, and then relax the system, and computed to, with, with very high accuracy the total change in elastic energy for every single atom on that surface. Then, um, so that's what this number here is. That's the total change in elastic energy. Along this axis here is the change in energy, is the, is the, is the Wij, the energy in the bonds that got immediately broken when I removed this atom. And we did that for every single atom. Every single case is there, and there, there are all these black dots, okay? Then if we just kind of eyeballed it, if you sort of stand back far enough, you draw two lines. You draw a, uh, a red line and a blue line. The blue line, for the most part, is, a, is an upper bound on the rate. The uh, red line is a lower bound on the rate. And then you have this green line, which we'll talk about later, which is kind of goes right through the middle of the, the dots. Anyway, those. Uh, So those, so, so since the um, since the change in energy is controlled by these things, you can see that this object here really is an upper bound on the change in the elastic energy, which means that this object, this term here, then is an upper bound on the rates of the atoms. So the idea is that that you put this into the rate tables, you can calculate this very cheaply, right? Because it's just a number that you you don't need to relax anything. So you fill the rate tables with these numbers. Then what you do is that um, you, when you select an atom, you actually then compute its actual rate by the procedure. You actually just relax the system, calculate the rate. And then if this number, uh, of course, this number should be less than 1. So depending on how much less than 1 is, you decide whether with what probability to accept the rate. So for example, if the actual rate is equal to the upper bound, then you, you accept the rate. If it happens that the actual rate is half the, uh, the, the, the rate estimate, then you should only accept it with a probability of 50% because you, pick, you picked it with a higher probability than you should have. So you don't accept it with the same probability. So, um, so that's how that works. Now, you may wonder what kind of justification do we have for these upper and lower bounds. Well, it turns out there's a wonderful paper by Eshelby in which uh, he considered a, um, an isotropic elastic material. And he asked, what's the change in energy if I remove a spherical object from that, that material? And from his calculation, you can show that 
that there are upper and lower bounds, just as I told you. This is what we call the WIJ term down here. This is the change in elastic energy, and you can see you get these upper and lower bounds. So these are mathematically, this is like a, a theorem. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the, the difference between these is actually uh, a function of the Poisson ratio. So for example, if you had a material with a Poisson ratio of about 0.2, uh, the upper and lower bounds would be the same. So that would be a pretty nice material, I guess, for a computational person. I'm not sure what good it would be for practical purposes, but... Um. Okay, so using this method, um, this was kind of the best kind of simulation that we could do. Um, you can see that, uh, that we can get dots forming. Uh, so. But the thing you notice, a couple things to notice about them is that they're awfully small. This is a pretty, you know, this is a, a much smaller system than I showed you at the beginning. There's like 128 atoms this way. There's no wetting layer, okay? Um, and the reason that none of these, there's, the reason there's no wetting layers and these dots are, are smaller than they should be is because the code is just still running too slow. We, we, if we wanted to see some, you know, if we want to see islands forming, we had to crank, we had to use uh, parameters that weren't quite physical so we could see something happening. And in fact, if you look at the other papers in this business, there's lots of papers nowadays that have tried to do these kinds of things. And you will see the same thing. They, uh, they use the, the artificially bad values for the, the uh, various parameters just so they can get some numbers. Okay, so then you can check, the, you can measure the autocorrelation as the film grows. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Now, um, one of the things that we uh, were concerned about, of course, is whether our method works. And so when you're doing uh, stochastic type problems, you, you have to uh, it's kind of hard to, since the, 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 the problems are random, it's kind of hard to check your, how you're doing. But, so that's why we use the autocorrelations, and we checked to make sure our method was, was behaving properly. Now, again, I was, I was saying the method is very slow, and we wanted to speed it up. So the first thing we did to speed it up was we made this observation that, you know, this green line is a pretty good approximation. So why don't we just use the green line and get rid of this uh, and, and not worry about uh, computing the change in elastic energy. So we did that. And uh, so we made this approximation. And then we wanted to make sure that it was a valid approximation. So we compared it with our other, we called one of the methods the, the, our gold method. So that was the, the slow method that was very accurate. And so we called that the gold method. And then, um, so that's the red line. I should have made it yellow, I suppose. And then there's this, uh, you can ignore the green curve, but look at the blue curve. So the, the red and green curves are very close. And the advantage, of course, is that the, the blue curve, to compute the, the, the morphology of that film, is, is twice as fast. So we gained a factor of two, not having to redo that uh, extra calculation of the change in energy. Factor two isn't very much in this business. And so we basically, it didn't really bias very much. Uh, but, um, and so we were kind of stuck for a long time on how to speed this code up. Because at this point, we are, we're nowhere near where we needed to be. And we both basically felt like we needed at least a factor of 10 or more to do something reasonable. So after much thought, we, we thought that, you know, we just really believed we, there was something we could do. And the idea, this isn't how we thought about it, but it's kind of a good story. Um, there's a scale separation in this problem. If you think about it, uh, there's two kinds of energy. There's a, a, an elastic energy and there's a surface energy. Now, elastic energy is energy per unit volume, and the surface energy is energy per unit area. So if I take the ratio, I get a length scale. Okay, and so the ratio of those things is the, the length scale on which um, Elastic effects are important. So if you calculate this, I mean, these are numbers you can calculate from uh, uh, just from continuum arguments. You, and you find out that uh, this ratio is on the order of 10 to 100 nanometers, OK? So that's the length, that's on, that's the length scale on which elastic effects are important. 
meanwhile, you have, uh, we already know that surface effects are, are important on the, atom, on the angstrom scale. They're on the, on the scale of atoms. So the fact is that, that if, th this, if this is your atomistic scale, then the scale on which the elastic effects are taking, are taking place is, is orders of magnitude a much bigger scale. So we should be able to do something with that information. Well, what this really boils down to in the simplest way of saying it is that add, atom, add atoms and dimers contribute very little to the uh, displacement field. In other words, the hopping rates are not significantly affected by the displacement field. And so you can see that here. Um, here is a picture of a film profile. And uh, if you look, what we've done is here's the, here's the original film. And here's the surface energy, elastic surface energy of this film. So notice here's the edge of an island. You can see how the elastic energy goes way up here. And then, and then, um, and then meanwhile, you have this uh, sort of constant elastic energy. And then there's a few dips down. Those dips down correspond to add atoms. The add atoms have very little elastic energy. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove all of the add atoms from this film. I'm going to relax the film profile and ask, what does the elastic energy look like? Well, it looks like this. See, so, so the elastic energy uh, doesn't change hardly at all. So, the, so obviously, it seems silly to constantly be updating and worrying about the elastic field as you move these add atoms around. So the basic idea was to do as follows, is from the actual film profile, we create a denuded film profile we call H bar, which has not just the at, not just necessarily add atoms removed, but you can remove whatever you want. We just have it basically removing all low coordinated atoms. So we remove, roughly speaking, that means we remove uh, add atoms and dimers. Then we redefine the energy of our system. Our energy of our system has now two parts. It has the surface energy associated with the original profile. And now we just consider the elastic energy of the denuded film profile. So we're ignoring the elastic contribution of the add atoms and dimers. Now the advantage of this approach, of course, is that now what we do is we just replace this formulation into our kinetic Monte Carlo where we use this energy in place of that energy. And why is that nice? Well, it's nice because we know that the thermodynamic properties that we had before, namely the issue of detailed balance, is preserved for this simplified or this new model. Now, there's a lot of issues that I don't need to go into, but, but it, the result is this, this, it can be uh, 15 to 20 times faster. Of course, you have to worry about whether or not um, you've done something, you've, you've, you know, what kind of fidelity have you given up? So let me skip that for now and come back to that. So the, we did three tests. OK, so the first test, um, I think these were fairly stringent tests. The first one was uh, just sub-monolayer growth, <coughs> island size distribution. It's known that elastic effects affect the island size distribution. So we dropped down a bunch of atoms on a surface and computed the island size distribution. OK, so the, the red curve and the uh, the red curve and the blue curve are the original method, and, and the, I can't even keep track. So let's see. The red curve is the, the, um, sort of the exact answer, and the blue is this new method. So you can see there's very good agreement. Now you might, a, a suspicious person would ask, well, maybe there's really elastic effects aren't affecting the size distribution, so you've done nothing. So we computed the size distribution, assuming there are no elastic interactions. And, and you can see that it, it makes a huge difference. So there is an elastic effect, and we're capturing it correctly with this approximation. OK, uh, something a little different. Here's a simulation of a three-dimensional island forming after three monolayers of, of deposition. This is with the a new method. That's the old method. So they're totally different. But of course, you would expect them to be different. It's a random process. So again, we just compared the autocorrelation functions, and you can see they agree quite well. Um, now, here's another problem that uh, people might have been very uh, uh, skeptical about our approach, is the issue of, of quantum dot stacking. Um, in general, what happens is if I have, a, I have here is I take an island, it's buried, and I deposit more material on top, and I let it evolve, 
it's known that it's energetically favored for an island to form right above this one, okay? Now, you may ask, well, how, in your model, the add atoms don't feel the elastic field, so you must, you're not going to, this is not going to work for you. It's not, you're going to fail badly. Well, I'm plotting here the dot height. So we define the dot height as the average height of the film in a small region directly above the island. So, so right here in a small region, we just, av we just compute the average height. And we call that the dot height. So what you see is the dot height grows. Then you fill a complete monolayer of material. You get a full wetting layer. And then at some critical amount of material being deposited, then the dot starts to grow. Okay? And again, you can see that both methods are actually giving the same answer. Okay? Now this actually leads you to a question is, well, how do quantum dots, act how do dots actually line up? And this was something we actually knew beforehand that this was going to work because uh, my former graduate student actually uh, made this observation, um, which is as follows. So if you read pap papers on this, you will, in the literature, you will find that the argument is that the, it's the ad atoms that actually feel the, the underlying buried dot. And, 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 then the, and also maybe the dimers do. This is not true. What's happening is that, that the, in fact, is the interaction of a dimer or a, a mon, an ad atom with a big buried island is too weak to be of any consequence. Um, if you, especially if you compare that with kinetic, the total thermal energy, okay? KT is probably bigger than the interaction energy. What happens is that the interaction, the alignment mechanism only starts to be, come into play when the islands get to a significantly large size that they can start feeling the buried island. And I can show you, uh, we have lots of evidence, but here's the one picture I want to show you. So this is the exact same picture I showed you before. There's an island buried under there, a big island buried under there. After 0.02 monolayers of deposition, I've deposited a bunch of material. There's no way you, it's, it doesn't know about the island. There's an island here. This, the biggest one is here. You'd think it would have been here. These things are not feeling the island at all. Excuse me, did, did you do some annealing kind of uh, like, uh, while you deposited the atoms to let them travel there? Yeah, this is being, this is there. To, I wouldn't say we annealed them, but it's being deposited at a very slow rate. Okay. Uh, now, if I add a little bit more, uh, so here's uh, a 0.05 monolayers. Even now, it's, you could make a bit of an argument that possibly that the, it's starting to feel the, uh, the dot underneath. But still, there's lots of atoms, islands elsewhere. And then only after you get to a certain size, here you start, this would be the first time you would make an argument that perhaps it's actually starting to feel the island underneath. So there you, the biggest island is here. Okay, so it really is a collective phenomenon of, of, of uh, and we always, we knew this for a long time, but this, this, this model actually allowed us to prove that definitively because we can actually turn off the interaction of the ad atoms. And it doesn't make any difference. The, the simulation is the so same. Those islands are now like, like uh, one monolayer or more than one monolayer? Yeah, they're all one monolayer high. One monolayer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I suppose if you went to low enough temperatures, but at the temperatures that people you'd have to get to a very low temperature before that would be, be, would be important. I don't know how low it would have to be. It would have to be very low. And, and also to keep in mind that, that, that I'm, a, I'm actually giving the, the ad atom theory the best possible shot at this point because I'm depositing this on a flat surface. Surfaces aren't flat. There's going to be step edges all over the place. The fact is that most of the ad atoms are going to go to step edges almost immediately. So. Uh, I, I really think it's th this collective thing is really what you need. Okay, so this is, uh, now I want to go back to something I didn't talk about, which was the parameter values. So this was like, so once we had the code working, I wanted, I wanted to see SK growth. And, and you know, I, I, I was lazy. I just put in some values and I ran a whole bunch of runs and I, it wasn't, I wasn't getting what I saw, wanted to see. So then I finally uh, bit the bullet. This is, was kind of painful for uh, me. Was um, I don't know if 
units are as painful for you as they are for me, but I had to put, calibrate the code and put in units. And so I had to, so it was a little bit of work, but you can actually, uh, you can actually take the, 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 the model and you can actually, given the bond strengths of the different species, you can actually calculate a surface energy. Okay, so this is what a continuum theory would tell you. If, it, if I took a simple cubic lattice and I broke it on the one, one, one facet, this is the surface energy, okay? Now, if I take the continuum limit of my ball and spring model, I can calculate elastic coefficients, okay? So these are experimental numbers. I can look, I can go to tables and look these things up. This one is a little bit more uh, tricky to get, but there are experiments. Uh, and that you, you can get ballpark numbers for both the, uh, for the ad atom hopping rate. And what these numbers tell you is they fit it to an Arrhenius law. And so they give you a prefactor and they give you uh, this number here, this, this uh, energy barrier for diffusion. So based on those numbers, I just put it in the code and um, I let it run. And uh, I had, it was a long three weeks. Um, Anyway, it took, this took about three weeks. So here's the first, this is what happens after uh, 0.5 monolayers. So you just get, um, it starts to grow. There's a lot of intermixing. Um, again, this is just due to surface interactions. Then at one monolayer, I have a flat film, okay? So I've got my wetting layer. Then I deposit 1.5 monolayers, and at this point, I don't know whether the ex experimentally you would see uh, islands or not, but uh, what there are se many things going on here that are worth noting. The first thing to notice is that there are definitely regions where you're doing nothing but adding to the wetting layer. Okay, so this is, these are just sub these are monolayer sized islands sitting on a substrate. So these are actually just part of the wetting layer or critical layer, if you wish. It's not strictly a wetting layer because I don't think I'm in thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, what else do I see? I see this object here. Notice this is a multi-layered structure, okay? It's not, there, there's actually two layers on top of there. That's, that's two monolayers high. And if you look around, you'll see other multi-layer structures forming. And then the other thing that you kind of can start seeing is that you have uh, the beginnings of, of, of an island forming, okay? Okay, so then, uh, I add a little bit more material. I have two monolayers. Now, what's interesting to notice is that um, it's just in a, in a change of 0.5 monolayers, things have changed quite a bit. So what's happened? Well, the, the dot, this one dot here, this one grew quite a bit, okay? So the heights of the dots, uh, that one got quite a bit bigger. And another, another, a number of them got significantly bigger. And the other thing, you'll, and, and you might wonder, how did they get so big? Because I didn't add that much material. Well, what happened is, if you look carefully, you'll see that they basically are uh, um, stealing it from the wetting layer, or this, uh, I wouldn't call it critical layer. They're taking away ad atoms. So if you look carefully, you'll see that the number of, 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 of um, islands that of one monolayer sitting on top of the wetting layer has, has diminished, okay? And, that, and the reason is that they're getting sucked up by these, these faceted structures. And then as time goes on, uh, the, the facets get bigger, and the wetting layer is actually now down to one monolayer. The, and the, uh, most of the, 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 pretty much all of the, one, the, the, the islands the, of height one that were sitting on the wetting layer are now gone. Okay, so now if you lower the temperature, you see more islands, it's not as pretty. If you go to a higher temperature, you can see uh, less islands, and you know, it's actually more looks, more looks like more like the experiments. Of course, this one takes a lot longer to run because it's at a higher temperature. Now, these uh, simulations actually uh, say, have a lot to say. Um, so, if, so, in general, uh, the formation of, of faceted islands on a faceted uh, uh, substrate is rather mysterious, especially if you're born and raised with continuum models. Why is that? Well, as I told you before, uh, semiconductor materials are, are uh, the surface energy is quite faceted. The, that means that, that the surface energy has a cusp. 
if you look at a flat surface, it's cusped. And that means there's a, it, to move the surface a little bit, to bend it this way or this way, there's a huge energy content. It takes a lot of energy to bend it. Well, where does that energy come from? Um, so, it's, so, so if you do a continuum model and you put in these sort of anisotropies, the, the continuum model has no way to, to actually form an island. It will not form a faceted island from a faceted surface. So there was a paper uh, in 2002 um, that suggested that when you deposit uh, germanium on silicon, that the, that the silicon, the 100 surface of silicon, for some reason, is, isn't a facet anymore. It's a, it's a stable, it's stable, but it's not faceted. So once you make that assumption, then it's easy to get islands to form. They basically force them to form. They change the free energy, the, the surface energy, so that, 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 that the islands would form. However, the, the, the simulations that we're doing here suggest that, in fact, you don't need to do that. It just happens naturally. And in fact, this mechanism was uh, suggested by a very nice paper by, um, actually, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, I guess, an academic grandson of Len Sander. Um, anyway, they, they argued that you should see, uh, what happens is that you formulate pre-faceted islands in a layer-by-layer -layer, um, nucleation mechanism, and then you form these pre-pyramids, and then islands form. And in fact, these pre-pyramids are, are actually observed in experiments. You get these little tiny pyramids, and they are actually generated by a nucleation mechanism, and, and the reason they occur is because they're elastically favored to occur. They would not happen otherwise. So in other words, this little, this guy here is sort of my favorite pre-pyramid. You can see it's this very, here's another one. They don't have any faceted structure, they, but they do form because of elastic relaxation, but they have not had time. So they're kind of metastable objects, and they can either disappear or they can grow, and if they end up growing, then they will grow into a faceted uh, island. And that's what happens. OK, now capping is another very important process. And um, so here's a picture uh, of, uh, so this is the picture I had before. What I want to do now is I'm going to add uh, blue atoms to it. I'm going to cap it, OK? So that means I'm taking, a, I have a silicon substrate. I make germanium dots, and then I add more silicon. And you may wonder why you do this. Well, actually, if you want to make a device, you've got to cap it. So it's, it's, you've got to do it. Um, well, what happens? So it's quite interesting. Um, so just so you, you know, um, so when I f started to cap these things, I was sort of expecting that I would just cover this with blue atoms, and, and under this would be, it would be like putting a tablecloth on, and nothing bad would happen. And so that was my expectation, and uh, so I uh, added some capping material, and I noticed, to my horror, that the that my dots were dissolving, and uh, you know they were eroding away very quickly. And I, I really was couldn't understand why, and I and I thought, well, let's just hope this stops. Uh, maybe it will stop, and. Uh, and, and, but it doesn't. And, and what, what's going on is that um, what's happening, of course, is that remember that germanium is a, uh, is a uh, low energy, has a low surface energy. So the reason there's a wetting layer is because the germanium is low energy. So all of a sudden now you're, uh, you're, you're depositing blue material down and uh, um, and so now the surface energy is much higher, and so the system wants to lower its energy. So the best, it needs to lower the surface energy of the system, and the only place it's going to get germanium is from, from the dots. So the dots wick away, and you can see here's a sort of a schematic. This is before capping, and this is after 6.6 .6 monolayers, and you can see that these things are wicking away. Um, now, 
after two monolayers, things uh, are um, pretty much, most of the dots seem to disappear. And then I uh, got to four monolayers and I thought, oh, at least I got something. Um, looks like I managed to get four dots. Um, so then, okay, so I kept capping and then I thought, oh no. So this, notice the one up there, it's, it's a, it basically, it's like a, a, a pimple that got popped. The, the, that little uh, chunk of, uh, this is a highly strained chunk of material, right? It's, it's yellow, it's trying to sp spread out, the blue's pushing in, it's very unhappy, so it ejects the material and it leaves behind a crater. Then you get a bigger crater. Then this one, create, you get a crater there. And at the end, uh, only one of the dots survived. The other ones formed rings. And this actually, and, I, and, and as it turns out, this is actually what happens in experiments. Um, there's a lot of experimental evidence that shows that, that the dots, actually Zbig has done stuff on this. I just found out during my visit. Um, the dots, uh, so, so th there are many, basically the dots will either, they will dissolve, they will form these ring structures, or they, some of them will survive. And this is all very much temperature dependent. If you lower the temperature, then this, the, the, they will not dissolve. And that's been observed in experiments. If you make a cross section of them, you, uh, you, you, you can see things like this. And if you actually look in experiments, you, you can see pictures like this. And actually, there's a group in, um, uh, in Eindhoven that actually used this code to compare with their experiments. And here's one of our pictures. Um, that's an, bottom is an experiment, and the top is our simulation. So this is one carefully chosen snapshot. but. Uh, many other features are similar. This happens to be one of the better pictures, but you can see that it captures a lot of the basic things that happen in, in this capping. No. They did it, uh, they, no. But we didn't, I don't have no, the thing is I don't have any, prem, I don't have many, I have, almost no knobs to tweak, to tweak. So if it didn't work, there wasn't much I could do. There's very little I can do for, the, for this code to change the answers. So, so if it didn't agree, there wasn't much. And in fact, if you look at, uh, at the, the original paper, you can see that uh, there's other things that don't agree as well. I'm, anyway. Uh, I should probably stop there. I think I've, I've kind of gone over. People already saw the off-lattice stuff, so I'll stop there. Um, that's a good idea. In fact, that's what, uh, in fact, the PFC stuff was what inspired us to do this off-lattice stuff. So it's actually, uh, in some sense, um, it is phase field crystal inspired idea. Um, and and the, the thought process was that when, when after I heard people talk about the PFC, I realized, well, what do you need for a model? Well, you need an energy and you need some dynamics. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we just use a real intermolecular potential? Why fuss with the PFC energy? And then just put a dynamics on that kind of, uh, with that energy. So the picture, what we do is, we just do, we, we pick, here we pick Leonard Jones, that's our energy, and then we just do a standard sort of off, on lattice kinetic Monte Carlo approach where we imagine that these atoms move to nearby sites. So we imagine it's close to a crystal, but we don't assume that it's really a crystal. And so, for example, this thing can form dislocations, which it couldn't have happened otherwise. So it's very, very much in the spirit of, of the face field crystal. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see you get a nice edge dislocation. So, um, so yes, I think that, that there are Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm very familiar with that work. I like it a lot. I, um, uh, and in fact, I liked it so much, I tried to do something similar. Um, 
Yes, they're on a different time scale. I would agree with that. But at the same time, um, they also have a hard time doing things like surface diffusion. You know, it's not clear how their atoms move around. So I would say there's advantages and disadvantages to both approaches. And uh, there's no point in us doing what they're doing. So uh, uh, I think they've got the, the, that whole thing sewed up pretty well. Um, but I think that uh, this is an sort of a, a complementary way of looking at it. Right, so one way to think about it is take a buried island and then take an ad, an, a single atom, yeah. move it along, and measure the total energy of the system. Okay, and you'll see that it'll go down a little bit. A little bit. Then you put two. Keep doing the experiment, okay. and then ask, when does the potential well get a lot lower than KT, say? I mean, if, if you're not beating KT, then what's the point, right? Entropy is running the show. Or you'd have to, you could ask, when does it get, a lot, get lower than uh, uh, how much the energy to take, detach an atom from a step? Right. Okay, so you have to get it, it low enough where it actually gets, that there's a significant enough of a well that it's worth doing. 